morning. We're going to read from James 2, uh, um, verses 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not your father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, this, his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what, th by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Let's pray for Phil. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again um, for your mercy and for your blessings, Lord. I thank you that they are new every morning. And as Phil comes to us now, Lord, we thank you for his um, commitment to study in your word, Lord, to bring it to uh, the church family, Lord. May we receive it with an open heart, Lord, with our eyes open and ready to receive your word, to use it this week as we go out into the world, Lord, to use you and lift you high and glorify you. We thank you for Phil, and we just pray now um, you would take any anxiousness or nerves away, Lord, that his word would be your word, Lord. We just pray, pray now, Lord, and ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks, Suzanne. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. The uh, passage that we're looking at this morning has been the centre of a, a great deal of controversy over the years. Bible teachers and, and theologians have grappled with these verses and debated them and puzzled them ever since they were written. One of the great battlegrounds of, of the Protestant revol Revolution, Reformation, was fought over these verses. The Protestant reformers stated very clearly that salvation was by faith alone. The Roman Catholic Church, in the, especially in the Council of Trent, on a number of occasions referred to these verses to stand for their belief that we are justified by our works, not by our faith. We are declared righteous because of our works and not by faith alone. It was because of these verses you've, we've just read that Martin Luther famously called the letter to the, of James an epistle of straw. There was a lot of, and there, there's been a lot of contentiousness, a lot of disagreement over these verses. Now, I could sum up this morning what I believe they say in just a few sentences, and we could all go home and have an early lunch. Amen, I hear you say, no, no. I, I do believe it's right that we look at these verses carefully to see what they actually say, because what James says has profound importance for us today. So, I hope you've had some strong coffee this morning. We're going to get into this. Let's look at it together. 
What, what is the main issue of these verses? What, what's at the heart of the controversy? It all centers on the gospel. And it all centers on that great truth that salvation is through grace, or by grace rather, through faith. And it is summed up beautifully in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, which will uh, come up on the screen. And it says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. How, how are we saved from our sins? How are we saved from God's judgment and from hell? The answer is by God's grace. How? Through faith, through trusting in Christ alone. John 3.16 says, doesn't it, it's, it's to whosoever believes in the Son, that person has eternal life. So salvation is a gift from God. It's not because of works. If it was, a, if, if it was because of works, we could, say, we could pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, aren't I good? Look what I've done. I've achieved this. I deserve this salvation. And God wisely has worked something else out. It's got to be by grace through faith. Now, the Apostle Paul summed this up beautifully in his letter to the ep epistle to the Romans. Romans 3, verse 20, which says this. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of of sin. And then in verse 22, it goes on to say, this righteousness, that's the righteousness you need to be accepted by God, to be accepted into heaven, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference, whoever you are, between Jew and Gentile. And then Paul, in that letter to the Romans, in chapter 4, verse 3, he gives us an example of Abraham. Romans 4, verse 3. Paul asks this question. What does Scripture say? He's going to quote from Genesis 15, verse 6. And Genesis 15 says this, verse 6. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, remember that, Genesis 15, verse 6. Just hold that in your, in your mind. We're going to come back to that. That's a key verse. Genesis 15, verse 6 says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to, to him as righteousness. I think that's wonderful, you know. God accepted Abraham just as he was, because of his faith. So Abraham was bankrupt spiritually in God's sight. He trusted in God, and God put into his bank account, if you like, his righteousness, God's righteousness instead, just because of his faith. And then just to make doubly sure that we understand this, Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been, what does it say? Justified through faith, declared righteous. We have, be, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That, friends, is so fundamental. I would say every Bible-believing church has put that in their statement of faith. We have it in ours. I've, I've uh, uh, put it on as well, our statement of faith, which says... The justification of the sinner only by the grace of God through faith in Christ Jesus, in Christ crucified and risen from the dead. Okay, so we believe that. That's what this church stands on. We are justified by grace through faith. 
So what's the problem? Let's have a look at James. What does James say? Chapter 2, verse 14. He asks this question. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Oh, so is that saying that without deeds, faith is dead? But it seems that way. And then verse 21. And James, he gives the example of Abraham, just like Paul did. And I'm reading from the New King James here. It says this. Was not Abraham our, fa our father justified by works? when he offered his son on the altar. Oh boy, that's a bit contradictory, isn't it? Abraham, justified by works. Paul said he was justified by faith. Abraham says he was, uh, James says he was justified by works, declared righteous by what he did when he offered up Isaac in obedience to God's word. And then, verse 24 this is what it says. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now, doesn't that contradict what Paul said? That it's by faith alone. We're justified because of our trust. And it's not by works. So James says, it's not only is a man justified by works, he says it's not actually by faith, and not by faith only. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, everything within me, every, every little evangelical bone stirs up, rises up and says, that can't be true. That's contradictory. James, James, James. Have, have you never read our statement of faith, James? Did you never read Paul's letters? Which is it? Are we justified by faith alone? Paul says that. Or are we justified by works alone? Which James says. How do you reconcile that? Or is it irreconcilable? Oh, boy, Matthew, thank you for giving me this passage. Really, thank you. <laughs> Let's, I think I need a bit more strong coffee. Let's, let's get into this. I want to show that James is not teaching something contradictory, but actually perfectly complementary to Paul. That's what you would expect, wouldn't you, if this is the word of God? And it is. First of all, let, let's, let's be clear. James really does believe that Abraham was justified by faith alone. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says this, And the scripture was fulfilled which says, here's the crucial part here, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and was called, he was called God's friend. Where we come across that before? Paul quoted that verse. Genesis 15, <clears throat> verse 6. Paul quoted that to show that J Abraham was justified by faith. James quotes that to say Abraham was justified by faith. Here's the problem for Abraham. God said to Abraham, God, Abraham was about 90 at this point. Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Abraham must have thought, that's interesting. My wife is nearly, well, 80 at this time. She's been barren all that time. Way past the age of being able to bear a child. And yet it says that Abraham believed God's word. Not only that he would have a son, that he, but he would have countless descendants through that son. And through that faith... God counted him righteous. And James says, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. The key to understanding this passage 
is that James is contrasting two faiths. He's contrasting living faith with dead faith. What's living faith? Living faith is faith in Christ. Faith in Christ that leads to salvation and new birth and a changed life and to fruitfulness. Dead faith is a professed faith that really is just an intellectual faith and a knowledge of who Christ is. We'll come back to that. James gives two examples of dead faith. And this is where we have to ask ourselves, do I have dead faith? Is my faith really dead? What does he mean by that? Well, the first example is verses uh, 15 to 17. I've called it dead faith, faith without love. Faith without love. So the first example, and it comes in verses 15 to 17. Let's read verses 15 to 17. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So what he's saying is that a professed faith that doesn't lead to practical love in action must be a dead faith. It can't have been a true faith in the first place. It cannot be a living faith. It cannot be a saving faith if there's no fruit in your life. You see, here's a a professing Christian, someone who attends church, someone who perhaps knows the Bible, someone who maybe even prays, says all the right things. And they see someone coming into church in desperate need, and they say to them, oh, I hope you're okay. I'm sure things will get better. I'll pray for you. And off you go. What James is saying is, how is that practical? That's that's not showing real faith. That's actually showing that my faith must have been dead in the first place. Because a a living faith will show itself in a life that's transformed with love for other people. And James is saying, don't tell me you have a real faith If you see people who are in need and you just wish them well, that's evidence of dead faith. A child psychologist one day got really angry with some children who he caught writing their names in the freshly laid concrete in his garden. And afterward, his wife said, but I thought you loved children. I do, he said but only in the abstract, not in concrete. (laughs) I know, it's terrible, isn't it? But we, we have to love in concrete, okay? Not just in the abstract. Not just, we can't just talk about that. Real faith shows itself in practical things. And that's why he says in verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. Can such faith save them? You know, if there's no fruit in my life, I'm just a barren, spiritually barren person. I'm not walking with God and not not going on with God. And there's no behavior that shows that I'm really born again. He says, well, is that real saving faith? You've got a dead faith. And so in verse 17... He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. It seems seems to me that James is, is concerned about counterfeit faith. About faith that really is not true saving faith. If I am truly saved, there will be spiritual life. There will be fruitfulness. There will be service. There'll be works of action. There'll be, there'll be 
clarity in, in, in the way that I live, my behavior, my attitudes, it will show itself if it's true living faith. M Martin Luther, actually, he got it right when he said this. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Okay? Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. There's always fruit. There's always life. famous preacher D.L. Moody. He was once crossing the Atlantic and there was a fire in the ship's hold and uh, that's where the cargo was. And he and other um, passengers and volunteers were helping to put the, the fire out. A minister friend who was standing watching nearby suggested that they should really go to the other end of the ship and pray. And D.L. Moody said, brother, we will pray as we pass the buckets. <laughs> you, you can't divorce faith from works. Faith and works go together. There's got to be fruit if we are truly born again of the Savior. And then in chapter 2, verse 19, he gives a second example of dead faith. And, and here I've called it Faith without surrender. So this is what he says. He says, you believe that there's one God. So you, oh, you see, you've got faith. Yeah, that's good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Do you know there are no atheistic demons? No agnostic demons, no, no liberal demons either. They're demons are believers, they believe in God, they believe in Christ, they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they believe in hell, they believe in judgment, and they shudder. It causes them to tremble. But it's dead faith. It's not active faith. You know, I think, I think this must be one of the most frightening truths in all of Scripture. There is a kind of faith in God and in Jesus Christ that does not save. It's possible to believe in God, to believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross, that he was raised from the dead. But it doesn't save because there's no heart commitment to Christ, no surrender to him, to his lordship, to his kingship. I, don't, I, I, I believe in him, but I don't want him to rule my life. Dead faith involves just the intellect, Sometimes, maybe the emotions. You know, somebody can be really moved by what they hear, the gospel. They can be stirred in their hearts. They can see other people and be attractive Christians. And they think, oh, that would be great. I love that. But there's no genuine surrender of, to Christ as Lord and Savior. No yielding. I like what Warren Wearsby in his commentary he said this. The whole person plays a part in true saving faith. The mind understands the truth. The heart desires the truth. And the will acts upon the truth. That's, that's real saving faith. The, the mind, the heart, and the will. And without that, faith is a dead faith. Jesus said, didn't he, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. People who think they are, but there's no fruit. That's the evidence of true saving faith. And, it's, and James, he's, he's deeply concerned about that. Deeply concerned. Any faithful pastor is deeply concerned that no one under their care, under that person's care, will be self-deceived. That's James's concern. And then he comes to living faith. And here we come to verses 21 to 26. And he gives two examples. We don't have time to look at both examples. One example is that of Rahab. And that's verses 25 and 26. 
I want to concentrate on Abraham as an example of living faith. And this is where we have this explicit statement in Scripture that Abraham was justified by works. Okay, so verse 21. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? So what what does James mean by that? The word justified means to be declared righteous. That's how Paul uses the term. The word in the Greek, dekersune, also can mean this. It can mean to be shown to be righteous. To show to be righteous. To prove someone is righteous. To demonstrate someone's righteousness. So it would read, was not Abraham our father justified by works? In other words, was he not shown to be righteous by his works? The context of the whole passage shows that that's what James is talking about. So what he's saying is this. Abraham offered up Isaac his son, in obedience to God. By that act, by his work of doing that, he was showing that he was a righteous person. He was showing that his faith had saved him. He was proving, actually, by his actions, by his works, that he was a saved man, that he was a man of righteousness. His, his faith was genuine. It was living. If, if, for example, if, if, I were to, if I were to be falsely accused of robbing a bank, I would naturally protest my innocence. So the police would say, okay, so can you prove your innocence? And I might say, well, at the time the bank was robbed, I did such and such with this person, and then I did so-and-so with this, such and such with this person as well. Hopefully, when my alibi was checked out, that would be accepted. So my works, if you like, what I did would justify that I was righteous, that I was a right person, I wasn't guilty. That is how James is using that word justified. Was not Abraham justified by works? Was he not shown to be righteous by his works? Our works and our changed life show that we are truly saved, if we are truly saved. They're the evidence of a genuine faith. So let's look at verse 24. This is that crunch verse, isn't it? You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And that's what he's saying. Do you see? It's the works of a Christian that demonstrate that they are truly saved. The works of a Christian, the things they do, their life, their behavior, their conduct, their service, their compassion, all those things, if you like, justify or reveal themselves to be truly saved. It's a living faith. The uh, New Life Translation translates verse 24. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Simple um, illustration is uh, we have um, an apple tree in our, in our garden, actually to be be truthful the apple tree is in our neighbor's garden it just hangs over our garden (laughs) so it's a lovely arrangement we enjoy their fruit uh, with their knowledge of course Um, now I'm a terrible gardener I don't know what the apple tree leaf looks like I couldn't tell you which is the difference so how do I know it's an apple tree duh (laughs) it's got apples on okay the fruit is the proof the evidence that it's a bona fide apple tree, okay? 
the fruit is the demonstration of its true life. If I say that I have faith, I profess to be a Christian, but there's no fruit, no works, no service, well, that means there's no evidence that my faith is a living faith. James is so blunt, I think. You know, he's, he would have met a great Yorkshireman. He's, he really is. He just speaks it so clearly and powerfully. If there's no life in there, then you don't have life. If there's nothing showing, then how can you be saved? That's, that's what he's saying. And it's summed up uh, by James in that, uh, the very ver uh, first verse of the passage where it says in verse 14, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? You notice how the word claims says? What good is it if someone claims to have faith, says they've got faith, but there's nothing to, sh nothing to show? Can that faith save them? No, it's dead faith. You know, there are thousands, thousands, I'd say hundreds of thousands of people in our churches, I would say, in the uh, UK, and in the America, and in the West, who claim to have faith, but don't. Who claim to have faith, but their lives do not show that. James says, says this, he says, show me your so-called faith without deeds and I'll show you what real faith looks like by my, de by my deeds. Real, genuine, saving faith will always lead to a changed life and faithful service. What, what does it mean? What does this mean practically? How, how does it work out? Well, those of you who have living faith, and so many I know, know the Lord, and praise God for that. It means that every day, your living faith is shown in your spiritual life, in your walk with God, in your love for God's word, in your desire to pray, in the grief you feel when you sin, in the quickness that you want to Ask God's forgiveness. That's, that's the evidence of the life that is a living faith in you. The way that you want to use your gifts for God, that's evidence of your faith, of your living faith. How you want to use your time and your energy for God, to please God. In the way that you love to give in that generous spirit and heart that God is giving you and is growing in your life. That's evidence of your saved faith, your living faith. The compassion you have for others. The concern for them. All of those things and much, much more. That's the outflow of the life of Christ. And all of that is bringing glory to Jesus. Eternal glory. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in church, in your home, in your workplace, in among your friends, on your own. Whatever you're doing, when you are living out that life, that is honoring to God, not only to honoring to Christ. Your fruit is bringing glory to him. What an encouragement, friends. These verses are, I believe, to keep going. To keep going and to grow in that. To be full of praise to God for every grace that's shown in your life. God is at work in your life. The real challenge for me, for James, this passage, is to any who are on the sidelines, maybe. If you're on the sidelines, maybe, you know, like an armchair Christian a bit. Looking in, looking in, and looking in, but never really involved in different ways of serving God. James actually says you're in danger. Be careful. Examine yourself. You know, if anybody asked me which football team I support, I would say Leeds United. I hear you say, whoa. No, no some, well, one person. Uh, thanks, Ian. Oh, two Ians. I, I, I would say, I'm a football. I always have, as long as I can remember, I look for the results. I follow their results. 
if I can get a chance to watch it on telly, I'll watch it on telly. I want them to get out of the premiership. So how many games have I ever, suppo- have ever been to? None. Never. Never. But I'm a supporter. No, I'm an armchair supporter. <laughs> and we can be armchair Christians. We, we, we can. I've been there as well. It's nice to have your feet up. Oh, God has prepared works for you to do from before the foundation of the world. God wants you to be involved. You know, Paul speaks just as much about this as as James. Paul said this, Galatians 6, 9 and 10, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let us do good therefore unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. Get involved. Wherever you are, serving God, being involved. Let me, let me just tell you, and I'll, I'll sort of bring it to a close with this. Let me tell you about a man called Larry Walters. Larry Walters, he was an American. He once got tired of just sitting around doing nothing. So on the 2nd of July, 1982, he attached 42 helium-filled weather balloons to a garden chair and lifted off, armed only with an air rifle, ready to shoot out a few balloons should he fly too high. He was shocked when he quickly reached 16,000 feet. He wasn't the only one shocked. Airline pilots reported seeing some guy in a garden chair floating through the sky. 45 minutes later, he landed in Long Beach. And when asked why he did it, he said, well, it was something I had to do. I just couldn't sit there any longer. (laughs) Neither are we meant to just sit there any longer, just waiting for something to happen. Living faith always looks for opportunities to express itself in real action, real practical service. Now, it may be that actually this letter or this part that we've been looking at has caused someone to conclude actually that their faith is not true faith. That, that's what the passage is really about. That's James' aim. Is your faith really a living faith? Is it? Is it showing life? Is it showing Christ's life? Are you walking with Christ? Are you living every day knowing that you are saved? Faith that's not accompanied by spiritual life and fruitfulness in which there has been no surrender to Jesus as Lord is dead faith. And it's better for that to be revealed now than when it's too late. The answer to that, friends, isn't to try harder and try and be better. It's to trust in Jesus and to surrender to him as Lord and Savior. Salvation is through faith in him only. Resting in him, but yielding to him as your Lord. So if you have never done that, would you do that today? Let God speak to your heart. This is very, very, very important, very solemn. If you have a dead faith, you'll never see God, never be accepted by him. But you can be today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's just take a moment. And as we think about... uh, the truths of this word, how it applies to us. And uh, God's word can be there just to stir us up, to praise him and to thank him, to reinforce what he's doing. Sometimes it's there to challenge us as well, that we need to do something about it. So do respond in your heart with faith and obedience. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the challenge, Lord, of this epistle of James. Lord, would you help us to examine ourselves in the light of this, to see if our faith really is a genuine, living faith, I pray, or a dead faith, producing nothing. Lord, for those who have a living faith, I pray that we will be encouraged to show our faith in action wherever we have that opportunity. Lord, would you help us in our church, in our homes, with our families, in our workplace, among our friends, wherever we are. Lord, we want to be fruitful for you. We want to serve you with joy and with faith. Help us to do that, Lord. Lord, we want to, we want to say, in the, in the words of the, the hymn that we're going to be singing in a moment, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Lord, thank you. You want, to, you want us to live life to the full. You want us to bring you glory and honor. Help us, Lord, not to live on the sidelines, but to be involved where we can and to be serving you with the gifts you've given us. And Lord, I pray for any who are here and they're not sure, and it may be that they feel that, well, maybe they don't have living faith. Lord, help them, I pray, in your mercy. Bring them to a place of conviction, of seeking your forgiveness, of confessing their need of Jesus, and to a place of full surrender to Christ. Lord, I pray, bring that person to a place this morning where they can say, take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to, afterwards, we're going to sing and then uh, Matthew's going to finishing prayer and a few things to share but uh, I'm just gonna I, I know we're going to the different community uh, parts of the community but I'll just stay around for a little while if anybody would like to talk um, about what I've been saying or anything then just come and uh, have a chat with me I've, I've got a booklet and it's called two ways to will to live and especially to help how, how you understand how to make Jesus king of your life how to make Jesus Lord just have a word with me afterwards so let's stand to sing